All right, welcome to the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital. I am David Brickley, and on the Business of Social, we examine the digital advertising industry and analyze how brands successfully increase their ad revenue and brand affinity through cutting edge content on social. In short, we talk to the experts so you're able to keep your thumb on the pulse of the ever-changing landscape of social and digital media. He's been a marketing manager for the New York Knicks, the director of digital marketing at Michigan University, Go Blue, and has spent over three years as a director of digital marketing and communications at Big Ten Network. He was also kind enough to treat me to a childhood dream of mine, go see the Cubs at the historic Wrigley Field, which I can't thank him enough for. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the goats of sports digital, please welcome Big Ten Network's Jordan Mallet. Jordan, what's going on, man? What's going on, David? Thank you for having me, my man. Absolutely. i um, excited to jump into it and just talk shop a little bit. I think you more than anybody understand live sports. And I think in 2018, as we look ahead in the in the future and where live sports is going with linear OTT, I would love just to start there. And, and I think the the industry of live sports and where you think it's going. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, clearly um, we are a, a rights holder. Obviously, that's that's the kind of the competitive advantage that that we have. Um, so we are clearly in the, in the live sports game. I think, um, you know, from our end, we are in a, in a great position, obviously. And, you know, as the conversation in the media um, kind of has, has unfolded where it's kind of ranging from, you know, subs are going down, OTT subscribers are going up. How many of those subscribers are actually watching versus just, you know, signing up, registering. Um, so from our end, you know, we are focused on live sports. Um, that is clearly our bread and butter. Um, we have um, clearly, you know, we were kind of the leader in the space when it comes to streaming with btn to go and launching that one of the first um, streaming apps to, uh, to ultimately produce and stream live games. Um, you know, now, 10 years later, when we, after, you know, we first launched, uh, clearly the, the landscape and the nature of the industry has changed. Um, from our end, we are now clearly um, with a joint venture of Fox. Uh, you know, where we see it is probably a closer connection to Fox and Fox Sports Go as it relates to streaming. Uh, you know, from an over-the-top perspective, right, uh, Big Ten Network being available uh, now on over-the-top uh opportunities, which clearly if we had this conversation two years ago, it probably wouldn't have been brought up. Um, but, you know, being available on YouTube TV, um, you know, being available on Hulu. Um, so I think that, you know, that part of the landscape clearly is not going to change. Um, we are clearly um, focused on our subscriber base um, and, and clearly a cable from that end. So I think from my personal perspective, um, I think the the numbers uh, may be a little bit over the top, pun intended, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to kind of the, the subscriber base decreasing. Um, but the beauty for us, right, is we have the fans, right? We have live sports. People are watching live sports versus, you know, again, everyone knows you're not watching live sports on delay. Um, so we feel, again, we're in a great position uh, to succeed uh, looking ahead. Just to, you know, I want to get your general take because I think um, what's most fascinating about live sports and linear and OTT is the business model for so long, what are we talking, 50, 60 years, has been to buy the rights of the product and then be able to leverage that product to sell to advertisers in a linear fashion, whether it be a 30-second ad or a presenting sponsor. And we know where it's going the next 10 to 15 years in terms of people, you know, Apple TV and OTT and making it more user friendly. How do you navigate, in your opinion, when it comes to linear and live sports to transition to where it's going digitally and OTT, but at the same mm -hmm. time respecting uh, the bread and butter that has really got the network there in the first place? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's what I, I think about every day now, you know, taking the digital perspective of it first, right? So, you know, as a rights holder, we also own the ancillary rights, right? So technically, we own essentially everything revolving and aligning with a school. Um, gotcha. So 
Um, from our perspective is, all right, so how do we kind of extend the window, if you will, of live sports, right? What can we do maybe from more of a um, sideline perspective? Or are there pregame shows going on that are, that are going on on campus that we can kind of tie into? Um, we need to be able to better, um, you know, have a better opportunity to sell our digital opportunities. So as we get a little bit more focus on on-campus opportunities, um, what can we, how can we tie in advertisers there? And I think that's, you know, it's, it's still so young in terms of digital social, right? What are, what are people looking at? Do impressions mm -hmm. mean something? Do views mean something? Does the community really mean the most? Um, so it's funny. And again, everyone has a different perspective on it. I think we need to get in the position where we are, we always think about this. How are we maximizing our rights, not only from an over the top pers uh, perspective, but from a digital and social perspective. And right now, you know, from my position, really, really working hard to in advance of the next kind of academic and fiscal year of how we, you know, view those digital and social components and how do we go to the market and sell those and what are, what are sponsors interested in, um, which I think, you know, no one has the silver bullet. Uh, if we did, then there wouldn't probably be as many opinions on it as there are. Right. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll fast forward to this question I was going to ask you is, you know, television, the advertising market and television, about an $80 billion industry. And you know, what I foresee is over the next five, 10 years, that money to start to sink in the digital simply because the fortune fives will eventually go where the eyeballs are. But mm -hmm. how far do you think we are away from a Gillette rather than spending 80% of their budget on television at a home to start to steal away from that and become more digital and understand that the eyeballs are, are, are the exact same or even more than maybe your traditional 30 second spot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as we have this conversation and the Super Bowl is two days away, I think, yeah. you know, you, you, you look away from the Super Bowl and you, then you look at the actual landscape. Um, you know, that, that's the question. I think we, we see it from our end where, you know, percentage, the percentages of people who are streaming, right, are continuing to, to rise, clearly not to the scale of viewership uh, in the traditional manner, but those percentages are, 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 are rising. Um, and as you kind of focus on, right, the average minute audience, um, you know, what are, what are properties selling against? And I also think about when you, when they, when the, as a, the Gillette and the brands understand of uh, where people, where the consumption is taking place. I agree with you. And I think we we're in a good position again, because our answer is easy. We have live sports. People are consuming it on the go, not only at home uh, in the traditional space. So I think, yes, it'll de definitely continue to rise. And I think as the way that ultimately brands and big 10 network included, how we sell against digital and social and not just your standard 30 second spot. Here's how many households you're going to reach. That's going to be even more dominant in the space than, all right, traditional pre-roll, you know, the notion of mid-roll, post-roll. Uh, what does branded content actually mean? Um, Cause I just don't think, right. Where it, it hasn't the, the space is just hasn't been mature enough where you know, Nielsen can come in and say, Hey, these are households. This is what you sell against, right? No one really has said, these are total views. This is what you sell against. Here's what a CPM is in the world of digital. And that CPM changes based off the scale of X brand. Um, so I think it's a, that's the challenge of it. And I think that's what's most fun about the space that, that we're in right now. And I think it's funny because Nielsen has always been the North Star for every television network. But even Nielsen, I think we both can agree, is really not a, an exact science, right? They're, they're following a select group of people, and then there are times in that mm -hmm. by market. Um, so mm -hmm. I think as we get into this digital age, people are looking for that um, – you know, that recipe that gives you the perfect, yep. and I think digital will give you more, uh, be able to track that mm -hmm. a little bit more, but even in the, the television industry, um, Nielsen hasn't been an exact science yet. Everybody agrees. Okay. Let's use this metric to uh, dictate price mm -hmm. and, and views. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and even, I think where we're going now in terms of actually, you know, Nielsen being able to track, not just your traditional sense, right. Traditional household, 
but getting to your average minute audience, uh, getting to you know what ESPN has picked up, what Fox has picked up in terms of a more aggregate kind of in, in terms of consumption. Um, so I think we're you know we're we're heading in that direction. Uh, and I also think Nielsen, in terms of their traditional and also social and digital capacity, is is also building as uh, we are clearly a, a partner of Nielsen as well. And you're talking about Nielsen's total total audience rating that they're they're rolling out. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think you know from our end we're not there yet. Uh, it's it's clearly a conversation we've had internally, um, but it's it's definitely top of mind uh, here here at BTN. Yeah. So as we move from streaming to your digital properties like Facebook and Twitter and really leveraging your audiences on those uh, major core networks, I think you guys did an amazing job with the Libman uh, sponsorship during the Big Ten basketball tournament last year. And even really making that well-executed branded content, cleaning the glass, which was the block of the block of the day presented by Libman rather than just slapping a logo on it. So the way you guys did that was really clean. And since we are in the infancy, how does um, I mean that's you guys are unique in that way where you're you're starting to get those type of sponsorships here in 2017, 2018. Um, how does that work? Because you mentioned before, is it views? Is it impressions? Is it checkouts? Is it website visits? Or, or how do you begin to start to at least put that package together on your end? Yeah, it's a great example, and I. I, I didn't know much about Libman before. Uh, you know, <laughs> now most, you do. most people know most people know they're the green mop company who yep. who wipes up courts at every uh, Big Ten school and across the country. Um, you know, Libman, it was a great client uh, because they're uh, they're open to new ideas, right? The perfect sense, and I wish to be honest, every, most clients were like Libman, right? They were open to. They had a really, really detailed plan of, all right, we want basketball during March, right? We can't get the NCAA tournament. So what can we get um, that's kind of, I guess, next to that? And that was their goal. And from our end, we were just churning, right? The ideas of, as you mentioned, right? Cleaning the glass, the Mach 5. Um, so, you know, we got our puns going, which we love to do. And they were interested clearly not only in highlights, but also custom content. And the way that we attacked that was just simply um, number of activations. So they were you know, purchasing highlights via Twitter Amplify. Um, and then ultimately, how many pieces of custom content could we produce? Um, and that was the number we were looking at. You know, clearly, we want to shy away from um, delivering X number of impressions, X number of engagements. Um, that's not probably the best game to be in right now, um, especially for us considering where we are in terms of the scale. Um, so we pitched ideas to Libman um, and they were open to the majority of all of them. I think we were testing out uh, kind of the mop cam, right? And we were testing out um, 360 uh, cameras from a Facebook perspective and a Twitter perspective via Periscope. Um, and you know, most importantly, the Libman kind of took a risk and took a chance with us. And you know, highlights, they're easy to understand. But everything else was not really easy to kind of um, understand and consume and really understand how successful it was going to be. Um, and Libman ultimately was our first digital-only sponsor right so they last year that's big during the basketball <laughs> tournament they had no linear um uh opportunities they didn't they weren't interested at that point so this year they're back uh so you can kind of sense if it was successful or not um and they're also introducing some tv elements but the mop 5 will be back um uh, we've introduced a little bit more um you know because we'll be in new york city for the big 10 basketball tournament um some iconic opportunities of bringing, you know, you could foresee the mop being um, taken around to the Rucker Park or West Forth and taking a picture of the mop, and you know, kind of, be, you know, letting the letting the mop become a legend of New York City. Um, so we're we're moving forward with that, and um, I think the that's the goal. I, I think it was easier for Libman, a little bit of a smaller company, if you will, right? So the opportunity to take some risks and be open to change. Um, and we're excited to kind of explore it again uh, later this month. Yeah, and I think it's interesting for anybody listening because it sounds like um, 
at least in the current juncture, it's really active number of activations or pieces of content, which from ROI standpoint, technically that can mean a hundred views or 1.9 million views. But it sounds like in this infancy, as we kind of go through this, that the sponsors are okay with just a well-executed campaign with the set number of deliverables, rather than like you said, we guarantee we're going to have, you know, 1 billion in potential reach yeah. with this campaign. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where we are, right? That's the space. It's still so young. And that's what I try to, that's what we try to tackle every day. And we, again, it's just came up earlier, earlier today of, you know, how different companies view social ROI. Like what is social ROI? You know, for teams, it may be different, right? Because they're maybe more based on the community. From our end, it, 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 it does, it definitely probably tends to be, it needs to be ad sales. It needs to be revenue generated um, because, you know, we're investing in these products. Uh, we're investing to make the content and we obviously need to see the return on that. So I do think we get to a, yes, I think the clear cut where both sides understand, right? I think some of it is the other side of, um, you know, the, the sales team up from their end or the brand itself kind of has a good understanding of what social truly is versus kind of have the, the linear um, kind of you know, lens on. And how do we ultimately get to an impression number or a view number? Because um, again, from a, from a streaming side, we are selling households, we are selling streams. Um, so there is a guarantee there. You know, I think again, still, still young in the space, but if there's a number of activations and you maybe pop, top that with a suggested window of impressions and your views, I think you're playing the game. Um, I would probably lean more towards um, a mix of both because, again, we all know a view is technically is that a view or is that kind of a BS model? We don't know, um, but at least everyone's playing off the same rules in that space. Yeah, I think you made a good point when it comes to Libman. I think for that sales guy to go to his VP and say, hey, we're involved in March Madness, one of the biggest events of the year. I think that means something regardless of, you know, we sold, you know, 14,000 Libman mops because yeah. of this activation. I do think there's a little bit of that brand awareness mm -hmm. and being connected to a brand like March Madness, like uh, Big Ten Basketball. And you guys can probably leverage that like, hey, yeah. you're going to be a part of what everybody's talking about around the water cooler. And that's a big deal. Yep, absolutely. And even more so this year, right, where we, the basketball tournament is a week earlier, right? So we are the only Power Five basketball conference going on. Um, so I think they're going to even have more of a kind of um, general voice in the game. And you're right. You know, we can't, not every brand, you know, some brands are different, right? They want to see that direct correlation. Um, but some of it when, you know, from a branding perspective, um, it, it worked out, you know, really, really well. And again, worked out so well that they're back and hopefully we can get them, um, you know, happy and we can deliver again this year. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I won't, I won't give it away, but I think, um, one example, it, it was a major television event, so I won't give it away, but they were essentially charging for a brand to be a part of it, uh, 25 to $50,000 per tweet. Uh, which seems incredible, especially if you're not guaranteeing whether that tweet's going to get three retweets or yep. it's going to get, um, you know, four, four point seven million retweets, which, mm -hmm. but I think we're in this space, which is really uh, interesting for you to hear where the number of activations is really where we have to be here in 2018. Mm -hmm. And as we grow and get more data, like a Nielsen total radiance, that's yep. when I think we'll get more into the guaranteed and, and even being able to add more money or boost your posts to guarantee that minimum, I think is kind of where we're going. Um, in terms of Social specifically, I want to share a cry with you when it comes to the Facebook algorithm. Mark Zuckerberg continues <laughs> to turn that puppy down. And I think um, it opens up a space in terms of people being able to execute on Facebook ads and really have a cohesive strategy there. But um, I, I want to get your opinion because I think there's an opening in the space for a network or a Snapchat to come up and help more with organic reach because the biggest platform in the game has yep. just really turned that off for brands. Yeah. And, you know, we're having this conversation today. They could change it tomorrow. Um, right. <laughs> and, you know, it's wild. Um, you know, my, my initial reaction was, all right, you know, again, content may be kind of swallowed a little bit, but from a Facebook perspective, I immediately thought, you know, ad revenue. Right. And yeah. as you just mentioned, right. Boosted boosting posts. Right. 
I think as you write, as you're talking to sports minded people first, you know, the some leverage that we have is we have content that is creating, um, you know, an expression or an act or an action, right? Just it's natural in considering the sports landscape. Um, but, you know, another opportunity that we thought about is the nature of groups, right? And, you know, and that was my other thought, right? You got ad revenue, but then you also have groups. And I think in the space of we've seen, you know, I'm not a big group guy on Facebook. Um, but, you know, if you look around the landscape, most people who are in groups are seeing group related content in their feed. And, you know, our thought is, again, we are concerned. We've never most probably like the majority of, of sports um, platforms, teams, et cetera, you know, probably haven't put all their chips on the table for Facebook. But um, from our end, we think, are we, we may be thinking about creating, you know, 14 respective Facebook groups, right. That live within our Facebook page. So you're thinking about, right. An Illinois Facebook group, a Iowa Facebook group where we're, you know, it's, it's going to start small, and then do you question, are you putting the time and investment in building essentially a group chat, if you will, right, where you're sharing content that we clearly own the rights to, and then a year from now, the model changes and the feed, the algorithm opens up again. Um, so that's been kind of the conversation from our end. I think um, from what I've read recently from a Facebook perspective, groups is clearly top of mind. Um, but from our end, you know, is the, is the investment as we you know talked about, um, uh, earlier, is there a return there enough? Because I think, yes, hypothetically it is, but are we going to see our content from our, from our Facebook page throttled, uh, to that degree where we kind of need to pivot? I think we need to see that first. Um, and you mentioned kind of the paid side of things. Um, you know, from an organic sense, um, and also from a more of a, a paid sense, I think if you're, we think about it kind of in the same family, in the same category, right? Um, you know, we are, we are sharing organic content clearly, um, but we are also boosting from a, um, a streaming, a viewership perspective. We are clearly boosting that. So that model is not going to change. Um, but I think the group um, opportunity is, is something that we're thinking about um we haven't seen the effects just yet um but i, I see in clearly from the news perspective they I, I see people kind of reaching out and making sure you see their news first um and kind of opt into that first um so yeah the model from our end is kind of status quo right now um i think from our end we've probably dialed a little bit back in terms of posting video um to facebook as much as we have been just to kind of see how the model is is mapping out, but yeah, we you know before the before this tweak, our goal was to get as much content as we can uh, up on Facebook as as we have been part of kind of the the revenue opportunities with them thus far, um, and we'll kind of see what the what the roadmap kind of entails. So it sounds like um, where you guys are going is really the opt in model because I think as a sports fan. Um, Zuckerberg wants you to see more of your friends and family, not necessarily 94 BuzzFeed articles, which I get, uh, you gotta make sure that the Facebook platform doesn't irritate people or turn them off, but no mm -hmm. offense to my aunt that lives in Montana, but I'd rather see, um, an Ohio state player yeah. dunking from the free throw line on a Thursday night rather than my yeah. aunt's post about her dog. So I do think there's something to, Hey, let me opt into this. And that way I can see all this content. And I think potentially to your point, groups can be that way. Cause even if I opt in as a fan to like big 10 network, yeah. uh, Facebook's not, not going to show me your content. Uh, maybe only 1% of it, which is, yeah. which is a problem. And I think we're in a unique position, right? Cause we're a TV network, right? So we're not the San Francisco giants, right? We're not a team, right? So you may be, we may be seeing less chatter about a specific fan because you know, again, no one is a, a, a fan or, or is a diehard fan of BTN. They may like BTN because that's where they watch. But that's why, you know, the model that we take from a Twitter perspective is, right, is creating 14 separate accounts where we're talking straight to the fan. And from a BTN side of thing, yes, 
we're targeting, right? But how far would that go? Um, so I think we're we're even a little bit maybe further behind the eight ball because, as you said, the opt-in for us probably makes more sense than a team um, because we're we're trying to talk to fourteen different fans, um, you know, d- every day. Yeah, you guys have a unique uh, challenge because you and I have talked about a lot. Where if you're, you know, if you're a Michigan diehard alum, you do not want to see Ohio State highlights. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. something that you are probably uh, you get sick over and and yeah. want to turn away from the computer. So, to your point, um, I think it's it's very self aware of you guys to know internally, like, hey, nobody is, you know, the diehard. I love Big Ten Network so much, and mm-hmm. I love everything they produce. It's probably more based on. I'm a Michigan alum. I love my Michigan and Big Ten networks where I can go to get my fix on Michigan content. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Love it. Um, So when it comes to Instagram, I think I've been a bitter old man when it comes to this because I've been talking about it a lot. But when it comes to being working in sports, as you and I do, uh, this is getting pretty frustrating because I'm seeing seven. I mean, I think I saw Antonio Brown is active for the Steelers this morning, <laughs> which is a major problem. When they got eliminated two weeks ago. So I don't know. I want to get your thoughts on this. If Zuckerberg and Instagram is trying to force sports uh, networks and brands to potentially stop posting unless it's evergreen um, mm-hmm. when it comes to final updates or even highlights, which really doesn't yep. make sense. Um, or do you think this is something where they're going to have to eventually – turn this algorithm in order to not uh, have sports fans see this old content. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm with you and probably everybody else in the sports landscape is with you as well. Um, you know, Instagram is just, it's again, it's not much like the, so- the social ROI, right? It's just something you got to have to, you know, keep beating down that door and seeing what works. You know, from our end, we've, we've clearly shied away from a tune in perspective, right? Because, that's either going to get lost or someone's going to see it on a Friday and the game was on a Tuesday, as you said. Um, so, you know, the, the tune in, the date specific copy um, has kind of, you know, we've, we've clearly shied away. Um, from our end, you know, we're trying to figure out what actually is that algorithm, right? What's going to pump through that? You know, we clearly have highlights, right? So, we have maybe a little bit of an advantage there. We're kind of first to market with the highlights. Um, but we've seen it kind of has to be a really, really unique highlight, right? Um, you know, where maybe there's something going on in a post-game press conference. Player X is crying because he's so happy after a win. That may rise to the top because most people aren't sharing that maybe dunk, right? It's your average dunk. So we've seen, you know, a few things pop. But other than that, right, the majority of content is relatively, you know, staying at an even pace. Um, And, yeah, I think it's a little bit like, well, you can start scratching your head and trying to figure out, you know, we I've tried to dig in the data and say, should we be posting more? Right. Like the the House of Highlights opportunity, right, where you talk about post, 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 post. You're ultimately going to try to beat the algorithm. But are you really beating the algorithm or is it the content? Um, or do you kind of slowly roll back like a la a Nike where it's maybe more tentpole event and the cadence isn't as frequent. Um, so I think we've tried to find a healthy mix because we just have so much content again that we want to get out there. Um, but I think we've seen more so the kind of the throttling of content more on Instagram than we've seen clearly on Facebook yet. Um, but you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an Instagram fan, um, but it it's something that I right everyone kind of thinks about every single day of is this working or is it trying to pretend <laughs> like it's working, um, and what's it gonna be like tomorrow? Because um, sometimes right we've seen during the Big Ten football championship we saw it right we we shared a good amount of content over a 48 hour period and it was consumed. But if you take that model and maybe it's a Wednesday or Thursday and it may just not work. Um, so I, I'm definitely with you in terms of trying to understand that. We've tried to look at the data and kind of dig in a little bit more um, and, and understanding maybe we slow it down. Uh, is there a week versus weekend mentality? I don't think that's true either. Um, but we just have to throw things against the wall um, or slow it down ultimately 
Yeah, and I think the the punchline so far, and you know, we spoke for thirty minutes now. I think the punchline here is, you know, you're damned if you, damned if you don't. When it comes to these social platforms, you have to find a way to hack it each and every month, each and every year, and it almost is like. You, you, you need somewhere to live. You can rent and you can give money to a real estate broker or what have you, or you yep. can own a home and you can, either way, there, you know, you have that 30 year mortgage. There's, there's <laughs> bad and pros and cons on both sides. So yep. I think to pat yourself on the back a little bit, the reason why you hire Jordan Mallow with, you know, the New York Knicks background and, and Michigan and someone that digs into it is because you have to have somebody that constantly is tweaking and kind of geeks out over the process in order yeah. to make sure that you're getting, you're squeezing every ounce of potential out of your brand with all these different social platforms. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to making sure, right. As a rights holder, that's my always the follow up is how are we maximizing our rights, right? Where we don't need to lean on the platforms themselves, right? So, yes, they're an outlet, they're a distribution platform, but can we create content that we know is going to be successful no matter the algorithm and kind of guaranteeing that revenue um, versus kind of saying, hey, let's just give our content away? And for us, you know, we're not a team. We're a rights holder. That's that's very important to us, um, and and we're we're going to try our best to kind of maximize it. I think uh, as we, I mean, since the dot com era, really, email has been where you can at least control your message and own your audience. And I and I want to get into that a little bit because it it can be frustrating when you spend potentially hundreds. Of, I mean, think I always think about Coca Cola, right? They probably spent a hundred million dollars getting more likes on their Facebook page, and then Zuckerberg yeah. goes. Kroop! And then all that money is usually you can't reach the fans you paid so much money for. But email is something that I think um, seems old school, but you can control that message and you do own that audience. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how you guys attack email, if that's still a major KPI internally for your, yeah. your rights. So glad you brought it up. I'm, I'm, a, I think my, I'm, I'm a big CRM guy. I'm a big email guy, um, probably email before social. Um, in my previous stops at the Knicks and at Michigan, um, you know, ranging from uh, A/B testing to subject lines to um, graphics versus, H, you know, just straight copy. Um, so I, I love the email CRM conversation and the notion of databases. Um, it's funny from from our our perspective at BTN, you know, we're we are a, a very lean company. And when it, when kind of in regards to uh, a network, so we are very light when it comes to CRM. We only really press the CRM button when we kind of have a, a specific um, kind of target in mind, like a tentpole event. Um, I think that's one opportunity for us that you know in entering this next next fiscal where we w- we want to ramp it up. Um, you know, early on. When I when I wasn't here, right when the, the network first started, right the opportunity was to build up a database so you could reach out to Ohio State fans and say, hey, we have Ohio State football games. Your cable provider is not offering the game. Start yelling and screaming, kicking, whatever it may be. That mm-hmm. did ten years ago, they didn't tweet, um, but that was the target, right? So we have a database, um, but that is a, a a kind of a an opportunity for us moving forward um and right now right our attack is just based off of bandwidth and resources we have the social digital space and then we kind of have this um you know this room to grow when it comes to email but i'm with you i can share you know the examples at michigan uh, it was much easier to sell into um ad units uh, because you know the open rate was x um and, you know, considering that you've opted in to receive a sports specific email, right, the likelihood is you're clearly going to open that. And no matter if the banner ad is at the bottom um, or even at the top, you're likely to see it. Um, so that is I, I'm with you from a CRM model for us. Um, it's an opportunity. It just hasn't been, um, you know, because, again, our daily model is you know, we're not really selling tickets. And I think that was right when I was at Michigan, when I was with the Knicks, uh, ticket sales and that daily grind of trying to uh, put butts in seats was key and understanding our audience, right? We have an understanding of who our audience is. Um, we we want to skew younger. Um, 
And are we going to skew younger through email first, or are we going to skew younger or try to screw you, screw uh, skew <laughs> screw, <my head. laughs> skew younger um, through social media, right? And I think most people would say nine times out of ten, it's social over ERA, um, email and, and CRM first. So, um, but I, I'm with you. I'm a I'm an avid email fan. Yeah. So, I mean, you talked about opt-in and Facebook groups. I mean, maybe something along the lines of 14 teen specific newsletters. I'm just thinking mm-hmm. of what I do with Digiday, yep. Tim Ferriss, TechCrunch. I subscribe to a digital newsletter that I really get a lot of value out of. And mm-hmm. again, I think uh, as as people in the digital and especially in sports industry, yeah, the algorithm can get frustrating when you're, you're and I think um, you know, from finding a way to control the audience more and not waking up to a mashable headline that yeah. changes your entire department. I think, I think a lot of people in your position are going to start looking a lot more harder at as they constantly have to evolve and adjust on a, on an almost monthly basis. It seems like. Absolutely. And I think that's a goal. We've had that as a goal of, you know, we, you know, we, w- we allow the fan to wake up with our content and make it school specific, right? So we take the same model we want to do on Twitter potentially Facebook groups and apply that via uh, email as well. Um, so it's definitely an opportunity for us moving forward. And one other thing too with the algorithm, and I'll get off this topic, uh, but <laughs> I think let's look at the 2017 men's basketball tournament for Big Ten Network. I mean, simply with the algorithm change, let's say you guys got 50 million views on all your video on Facebook and you go to your president and say, listen, man, we we 10 x it. We got 50 million views. Great job, Jordan. You're doing a great job. Then you come back in 2018 and your president says, how we do on Facebook? Like we're down 25 times, 25 X. And we did the same content strategy. We posted the same amount of videos, but we got 2 million instead of 50 million because of the algorithm change. Uh, are those conversations that you have and you just have to kind of let them know how it works? I think especially when you're dealing with the higher ups, they yep. may not be in the day to day and it's tough to explain why we're down and is it Jordan's fault or is it Mark Zuckerberg's fault essentially? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And it's funny because we've had those conversations just from an impressions type from Facebook. Um, you know, for us, we have a little bit of a, a head start because, right, we may see varies monthly, year over year. Just look at the football season, right? So, um, you know, we may have an awesome play, right? So Penn State blocks Ohio State field goal. They go on and win that game, right? That's millions and millions of views right there. So, and then you look at this past, whatever, you know, October or November, and maybe you don't have that big play, right? So your engagement and views are maybe already kind of a little bit volatile right there. Um, so we always have that opportunity. And for us, again, because we're a TV network, we kind of need to rely on those big plays, but also kind of just overall tonnage. I think when you're speaking, when we're speaking internally about tonnage, Right. We just want to get as much video out there and consume and to try to ultimately beat that algorithm and beat the ebbs and flows of highlights. So, yes, we and that's where, you know, again, do we we need to tie the revenue to that. Right. So that conversation is easier. Right. So Libman. All right. Well, knowing that they're in for this year. And technically, right, we're not selling against views or impressions. So we have that essentially out. Um, we're, we're reaching that number of activations. But if we're looking for more reach, then that's where we need to kind of get into the model of boosting that post. And are some of their ad dollars being put into the system to boost it uh, to try to reach a larger scale? So I think, you know, it's great, right, because every day is kind of a learning curve especially for the people who are kind of leading the charge um, and people, uh, you know, right for the, clearly the executive teams uh, to have, you know, an, an understanding of what's taking place. Um, and I think from our end, we're in a good position of understanding that there's, there's ebbs and flows in the content, but, you know, going back to the first point of what that algorithm means probably means a little bit more ad dollars um, from our, from our end. Hundred percent. So I'll get off the algorithm, but I think that's fascinating how you um, really, you know, try to. It's a puzzle piece. Every single day, you're trying to evolve and trying to move and groove and adjust based on what's going on. So it's a constant, uh, constant change. But uh, I wanted to ask you this: What do you think? You know, director of digital at a television network like Big Ten Network. If I were to say Jordan, what's your main number one KPI? If you can give that to me, what do you think 
Jordan Mal is responsible for Big Ten Network and your number one KPI. Yeah. So uh, as a TV network, um, you know, when I first got here, it'll be three years, actually, probably a few weeks here. Um, time flies. But, you know, from our end, you know, it's it clearly when I first got here was it was viewership, viewership and viewership. And obviously, viewership is always going to be a TV network KPI. Um, then, right, as a as a secondary, but maybe not even secondary anymore now, is streaming, right? Streaming, streaming, streaming. And aligned with that, it was downloads, right? So last year, it was downloads of the app. And now with kind of the partnership uh, and overarching uh, content time with Fox, right, we can see a position where ultimately BTN to go um, you know, most of that content, right, is flowing into FS, you know, Fox Sports Go now, right? So we've dialed it down from an app download, but more of a usage download, right? Retaining those people. Um, and now we've become a content company, right? And that's from a message from our president. So now the model is, okay, how much content can we get out there uh, while, you know, maintaining the core principles of clearly eyeballs, streaming but then going back to the overarching theme of maximizing our rights uh so that is a those are kind of the 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 big pillar kpis you have your viewership you have your streaming and you have your maximizing of rights uh and that's kind of what you know we look at every day um and that that's the end goal right and i look at sports teams and when i was with the knicks in michigan right you could probably tie in a little bit more community there, right? A little bit more engagement. Um, from our end, we have we have a different KPI, um, so we have to look at it a little bit from a, you know a different lens. But that is insane. I mean, just in your three years, it seems like every year there's almost a, a new bullseye um, going. Just three years ago, which isn't that long ago. You, it's it's viewership and then it's streaming and then it's download apps. I mean, uh, it really is incredible. I think you would agree how fast this thing's moving um, and and what your KPI may be in 2019 and 2020. Um, yeah. It's just a constantly moving bullseye. And I think the next KPI, at least personally, is how do you figure out what's the social ROI, right? And then that's a, then you're trying to figure out that next KPI of, okay, year over year, we've generated X dollars from a digital and social perspective. Uh, and how many, you know, how much ad revenue is going towards linear versus content? And I can probably foresee uh, an FY19 that, you know, that trend to continue. So one thing I wanted to mention, I don't think a lot of people are talking about in the news, as we've seen all these different mergers and acquisitions uh, throughout our space. I don't mm -hmm. think a lot of people are talking about the social uh, element to this because. There can be a lot of different television networks that all of a sudden go under a new umbrella, but all those mm -hmm. digital rights and all those social rights also go through that. So I just want to see if you've you've thought about that and and what that means when a merger acquisition happens and all of a sudden all that opportunity really from a social platform and an audience standpoint also moves over in that deal. Yeah, I think you know from my end it's a, it's a, a unique space and and um, you know, with the, the recent news of, you know, Fox and the regionals, I think that's becomes a clearly an important opportunity, um, from our end, right. We haven't really clearly needed to think about that from, but from an outsider looking in, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, what happens to, um, all this, uh, ultimately if it goes through and the merger actually, uh, occurs, right. What takes place with all the regional handles, right. And all the regional social handles, um, and what does ultimately, ESPN do with those with that uh, and does it merge under um, ESPN yeah. or do they keep it in kind of their own little islands? Um, you know, we see it from uh, it's interesting in, in, in terms of where we are in benchmarking and comparative sets, um, you know, the SEC network, right? I think that's a good example of not really a merger and acquisition, but you know, it's a model where ESPN owns the SEC network, right? So we're battling, you know, SEC network, but, they're also under the umbrella of ESPN. So they have you know, that scale and that reach. So I think we probably apply that same model from these mergers and acquisitions. It's like, well, who's the king right now? And you're probably going to kind of roll up into whoever that king may be. Um, and I think you know, probably what gets lost is, is primarily like the voice, right? The tone and tenor of X, uh, of X kind of platform, right? And you know, with the amount of people that are probably touching an account these days, 
um, you know, whether it's one to three to four, and depending how big these companies are, um, I think that's that's a key of, of of maintaining that that same tone. Which from our end, even as we're not going, you know, through that um, between, you know, up to six people, um, you know, throughout the week and at different times, managing that that tone of a TV network um, and not really towing the line. Um, that's I think that's probably the most important piece of, of that conversation. All right. So hopefully a fun question for you. What do you think um, in our industry, what brands in your opinion do you think are doing it quote right uh, on social? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I try to get out of the, um, the sports world when we talk about doing it right. I mean, I, the group think in sports is incredible. Um, I think that the ultimately the, the like mindedness, mindedness of sports is you have to remove yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, clearly I'm following what the sports world is doing and who's building creative and why are illustrations hot here and will illustrations be hot in four weeks? I don't know, right? Illustrations were pretty much nothing last year and now they're the talk of the town. Um, so I try to remove myself a little bit, at least from a Twitter perspective. Um, you got to remove yourself a little bit from hashtag SM Sports every now and then. But, um, you know, I try to follow... You know, Business Insiders is a is a is a um, a platform that I look at a lot, just in terms of how much content they are churning. It's crazy. It's it's unbelievable, and how many accounts they have. Um, you know, National Geographic uh, again, a large scale, um, but not so much content because it's not clearly we can't relate to animals. Um, but in terms of their cadence and their messaging, and I think you know Business Insider. I look at them uh, of how they present their kind of the text overlays, right? Their lower thirds uh, and how often they're sharing and then ultimately kind of resharing that content and what that cadence looks like. But from a sports world, um, you know, we, I mentioned Bleacher Report all the time and um, probably a little bit of an unfair um, mention because just by the sheer resources that they have, um, they are, you know, I marvel at how fast they turn content around, much like you well, guys. Two hundred eighty million dollars helps helps that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, you guys turn turn the content around as fast as they do, uh, whereas we turn around. You know, I take we take pride in kind of turning around highlights as fast as anyone else. Uh, that's what we pride ourselves on. Um, so we look in the market of you know if there's a game on Fox and we have the rights, right? Is Fox Sports are they cutting it? Uh, how fast are they cutting it? How fast is ESPN cutting it? Um, so we need to be in that space. Um, and one thing that, you know, I like to look at it from maybe a different lens of, you know, ultimately who's stealing content? You know, that's important to us as a rights holder. Um, and we have partnerships, but, you know, we don't need to name names, but we understand who is stealing content and Ultimately, sometimes platforms allow you to steal the content, right? They make it easy. Um, and that's, you know, that, that, that hurts in terms of the overall kind of pre-roll ad opportunity as, you know, X, X property is stealing your content um, maybe as, as quickly as you're getting it out there. Um, so in the sports world, I think, um, you know, I, I, I tend to, to rely on Bleacher um, often. Um, but I think even I think the college space because I've clearly I've been in the college space and the pro pro space. I think college space is just you know when I was at Michigan again three plus years ago, the overall landscape and the notion of digital in college has just blown up. Uh, it's been incredible. I mean my my position when I was there was a new position, and now you can go to the a majority of schools and they have a digital related um, you know position. Um, so I think, I think sometimes I, I, I go to, I go to college a little bit more than sometimes pro. Um, but my, my wheelhouse is TV networks, um, such as TNT, right. And we know they're near and dear to you. Um, but <laughs> TNT for sure. Um, and you know, basically, you know, what their basketball model looks like, uh, and, uh, kind of working off of best practices from, from, uh, from the space. Yeah, to piggyback off your comment, I think it's really interesting because Adam Silver and the NBA said, listen, 
everybody use our highlights. We don't care. Mm -hmm. That's our marketing tool. And I've actually given this example to you before, as we've talked a lot about this is I'll see a highlight of Ru Russell Westbrook, you know, slamming his arm through the rim. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's Thursday. It's on TNT. Let me flip mm -hmm. on the linear television. And that may be from House of Highlights. It may be from, um, you know, some random account that I follow. So how do you guys factor that in? Because when you say steal highlights, there's also another, I guess, uh, train of thought when the NBA is like, everybody use our stuff and that increases our brand message essentially. Yeah. And I, I, and I, again, the NBA is the top of the line when it comes to social. Um, you know, for us, we're in a different perspective, right? Different scale, different reach. Um, and, you know, in terms of buying the rights, um, again, the overall pillar is how do we maximize those rights? And we just want to be in a position where we are ultimately having conversations with people who, uh, platforms who may be interested in our content, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make that partnership, right? So we've had, we have um, relationships where they can use our content. Um, but for those platforms who are not, if they have a large enough scale, right, you kind of question, okay, well, what are we doing here? And maybe, you know, from a, B, from a business development side, let's talk about opportunities where we can partner. Um, I think if it gets excessive, that's where it's like, yeah, it's yeah. no help. Um, you know, just last week, the Penn State shot, mm -hmm at the buzzer to beat Ohio State, right? That was everywhere. That was post-game, um, a little different when you get post-game. But I think, you know, it's a wild, wild west when a brand is, again, sharing it not so much to promote BTN, but essentially to say, hey, we got it first and we're going to pretend like this is our content when that's a little bit of a different mentality than I think the NBA needs to. That's their, that's yeah. their, their approach, right? Because they're one of the largest, you know, brands in the world, where we are trying to again not allow our, our content to be because because I think another big conversation is how does it affect um, you know the, the ultimately the beat writers and the blogs of the world, right? Where you see X blog saying, "Hey, this other blog is stealing all this content, and we want to be able to do that, but we play by the rules, and this other company doesn't." Um, so that that's a that's a problem I think most companies have of where what is that line, um, and we we approach it where we would like to create opportunity and work with partners versus kind of just allowing the the stream to you know just be open and say hey here's our content do do what you wish. Yeah, I think you make a good point. There's a difference from the NBA and the rights holder when you spend hundreds, if not billions, of dollars on rights, and you see somebody else potentially leveraging that on their own and you're not able to leverage the fact that you have the rights and make more money on digital. Uh, I can imagine if you wrote a check for a couple hundred million dollars, that's a very frustrating thing uh, for anybody. <laughs> it's like, you know, buying a Maserati and having your neighbor take it for a spin uh, yes. every every other day. So it makes I sense. No, I have no idea what that, what that would be like, <laughs> but I would love to. Uh, I wanted to jump into this Ad Week article that I was reading. That's very cool with the uh, with Big Ten Network, and, and we talked a little bit, we're pretty much in the beginning of the program about the increased television and digital viewership. But after reading that article, I wanted you to kind of expand on that and, and how big of a deal that is for you guys internally. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, from our end, we are creating, uh, we have created, right, and it goes back to creating more campus programming, right? So. The overall pillar of rights and maximizing those rights and so we've created these positions that have a very long title of multi-platform video producer editors long-winded name a uh, better acronym of mbpes and we've essentially said okay we the btn has been around for 10 years we never had boots on the ground right so we've created uh entering this past fall created a pilot program where we were having a uh, hiring people to be essentially a producer and an editor. Um, our goal was to have someone who was probably fresh out of college who had worked in the respective kind of production departments at each school. So we chose, um, ultimately chose uh, to move forward with Penn State, Minnesota, and Michigan State. So in this pilot program, what have they been doing? They go out. Um, we provide all the equipment. That's the investment from our end. They're a BTN employee. And the one caveat is they need to be embedded with the athletic department, right? So this is not a, um, 
a newspaper or a blog, you know, coming to a press conference here, coming to a press conference there. This person is within their walls. They are seeing them every day, clearly more than they're seeing myself. Um, and where we are now is a, after a really, really successful fall and middle of winter, um, we hope to expand that program to seven to eight schools. And then that's where we get to, hey, what, what's the ad sales opportunity, right? Now we're selling a little bit more local, whereas from our end, we sell a little bit more national. But is there a Buffalo Wild Wings in Minneapolis? Is there a Dairy Queen, right, uh, located in Minneapolis? Um, and do they want more school-specific content? Because the Learfields of the, and the IMGs of the world, right, they don't own the Big Ten rights. So, for example, if they're going to partner with Minnesota and do a Facebook campaign, it's primarily just form fields, right? Or it's a static image. They can't include video highlights. Now, right. is there an opportunity where we're going to um, to the school and they're going to the client and saying, hey, we can produce school-specific video um, for the first time ever. So we're excited about the opportunity. Um, again, a pilot program, we started with three. We're going to hopefully add four more before the next academic calendar year. And the great part about it is access. And it's really not football and basketball. It's actually more Olympic sports. And when we go, you know, as we were talking earlier about tonnage, the sheer volume that we've produced, the MVPEs that, that, that have produced this type of content, it's been incredible. So we're excited about the opportunity. We're, we're trending in the right direction. And I think you know, this model, we're kind of hopefully, you know, we're first in the space and hopefully this is a model that um, can be carried out at all 14 schools within the next you know, three to five years. Yeah, that's fascinating. I think um, I, I said this to Brian Schraby on the last show, who you and I know, but uh, you just get it, Jordan. You really do. So I think being able to con <laughs> consistently kick that can down the road and find different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating what you guys are doing. You guys should be proud of, of where you are in the space. Um, I will leave you with a random sports question. Will Please. the XFL be something that actually uh, pays off and can be a successful business model? You know, I love the 30 for 30. Uh, and as soon as that announcement was made, I jokingly made a, made a comment to my, my colleague, say, hey, I'm going to head to the XFL because this seems like a good long-term play, <laughs> kind, of, kind of jokingly. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I don't know for how long, but I'm optimistic in the entertainment. Um, and I don't know what that means for you know, Johnny Manziel or Tim Tebow's of the yeah, world, yeah. but you know, if they're ultimately Johnny Manziel makes, makes a, you know, is on that field for the first game. Um, but again, as you talk about, you know, being a difference maker and going kind of a, against the grain, I'm not going to question Vince McMahon. I know. That's the thing. <laughs> I agree. Well, um, Jordan, it's been a, been a really good talk. I think a lot of our audience will find a lot of value, uh, from what you bring from, especially the television, the right side. It's been, it's been really cool. Stay warm. We talked earlier about uh, the minus eight degrees out there in Chicago, but uh, mm -hmm. really appreciate the time, man. And and we'll make sure to continue this conversation soon. Thanks, David. Stay stay warm in uh, sunny San Diego. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. Take care. <laughs> All right, dude. Yeah. All right. There he is, Jordan Malla. He is the digital marketing and communications director at Big Ten Network. Um, really great conversation. I think having somebody at the television network side of things that owns the media rights, I think overall the the OTT and people cutting the cord, it, it seems like from his standpoint, does not really scare him. It, it's a natural evolution of where we're going. And I really do think people in sports and live sports, when you talk about you know television programs that are going to, to OTTs like Netflix and Hulu, maybe the NBCs and you know, the VH1s of the world that have reality shows, maybe the OTT thing is scaring them a little bit in terms of ad revenue. But in the live sports angle, people are always going to want to watch live sports. I'm a San Diego State alum. I'm always going to watch San Diego State basketball if they have a big game or they make the uh, March Madness tournament. So I do think the sports networks that have the rights and live sports, sure, how people consume the content may be different. It may go from uh, the linear television down to the mobile device or the iPad or even go from an app where you can throw it to your TV. But live sports are going to continue on in this country for hundreds and hundreds and if not 
uh, millions of years from now. So I think they're in a good spot. And I think just overall, when it comes to the algorithm as well, it's just a constant evolution. It's a constant shift in uh, what you're able to do in that position. You got to move and groove and Mark Zuckerberg and put the puzzles of the pieces together. And we're all dealing with it in this industry, right? How do we hack Facebook? How do we hack Instagram? How do we make sure we're getting the most organic engagement uh, with those beautiful, amazing digital billboards that are at our disposal? So it's a constant conversation. It was great to talk to Jordan from the television network side. Hope it brought value. I want to shout out producers, David Furker, and, uh, Auntie Lightsenden as well on the keys. And uh, we appreciate it. Business Social. We'll be back soon.